Good evening. Good to see you all. I did miss you this morning. I had a, a elder in the church in Shawnee. Uh, Kathy and I ran into them when we were in Branson here about a month and a half ago. And we were talking to them, and we got to talking about Bible Talk, not TV, and and they downloaded it on their phones and uh, really liked it. And so he's been talking to me about coming over to Shawnee and sharing with the congregation about that. And we've been looking for a time. Well, this week, their preacher uh, tested positive for COVID, so he couldn't preach, so they called and says, hey, how about now? Would this work? So <laughs> very short uh, very short notice, but I was able to go over there and talk to them about Bible talk and uh, uh, share with them how to use that ministry and how to be a blessing to that congregation. So, But I, uh, I missed you all, and so it's good to be back with you again. We are going to be in the book of Acts a little bit, so you can turn to Acts chapter 8. And we're there's an outline in the bulletin, as usual. You probably recognize the title in the picture, Levels of Faith. I've preached many, many times over the past 30 years on this subject, and I've taught it as a class, and I believe as a sermon series years ago. And uh, maybe you're wondering why we're repeating this. Well, I got to looking through the directory. Do you know how many new families we have in the past three years? People that have moved in or been baptized, uh, there's, there's quite a few people that don't know about new levels of faith. And yet we talk about it in our classes and uh, sometimes in fellowship. And so I thought it'd, be, it'd help our, our newbies, our, our ones that aren't familiar with this, to kind of understand what we're talking about when we talk about the different levels of faith. This all started... The first place that I preached was in Burlington, Colorado, and I was, I think it was 27 years old. I uh, didn't really know what I was doing, but I was fascinated with the way faith develops. And I remember watching people who grew up in the same congregation, and in a small town like that, most of those people had never been anyplace else to go to church except maybe a vacation or something, but a lot of them just knew that congregation. So they grew up hearing the same sermons, the same classes. There were big families there, so a lot of them even grew up in the same family. And some of them, over the years, their faith would really grow strong, and then others, it didn't grow. Then I was really curious about that. I was curious about what causes faith to grow and how to recognize growing faith. And I started studying it, and I started. I wrote a book about it, and then I got asked to speak a lot at seminars and to talk about reaching new levels of faith, and wherever I would go, I would ask in a congregation, well, who in this congregation has strong faith? Who would you say has the strongest faith? And there were several names that would be mentioned, oh, this sister or that brother has really strong faith. And i go talk to them about their faith and say, you know, what, what do you think made your faith grow? And I began to see patterns. And then I also saw the same patterns in the Bible, which didn't surprise me. And I learned that we go through stages of our faith, much like we go through stages of life. We start off with infancy. And then we become toddlers. And then there's pre-adolescence. And then there's adolescence. We go through these stages of life. And I found that we do the same thing in our faith. We go through these stages of faith, but it is no more automatic than it is with physical development. As you know, every once in a while a, a child becomes stunted in their growth for some reason, malnutrition, or maybe there's a, a medical condition or something and they don't grow. Well, the same thing can happen spiritually. The natural process, as we are coming to church and coming to classes and reading our Bible and praying, is that our faith should be growing. But it's not an automatic thing. It's something we have to be intentional about. And so I'm going to share with you tonight some terminology that helps us to understand how our faith grows and what the different levels of faith are. So the first one I want to talk to you about is imitating faith. Imitating faith is when 
I don't really understand. I just watch and I just imitate. This is basically the faith of a child. What, is, what does your child do when we pass the, the bread and the fruit of the vine down the, the aisle? What, what do they want to do? They want some too, right? Because this is what everybody else is doing, and so it's just natural to imitate that. When the plate comes by and people are putting the money in, they want to do it as well. Do they understand what's going on? Do they understand why we're taking the Lord's Supper? No, they don't. But they want to imitate. And so this is the, this is the infancy stage of faith, imitating faith, where I don't really understand, I just do what you do. The second level is affiliating faith. And with affiliating faith, there is understanding. The only difference between imitating faith and affiliating faith is in the understanding. Now I understand, but I still just do it because of who I affiliate with. I grew up in such and such a church. Here's what this church believes, therefore that's what I believe. And this is the most common kind of faith there is, is affiliating faith. We watch, we, don't, we, we do understand it. We understand why we're taking the Lord's Supper. We understand how a person becomes a Christian. But it's not really an owned faith. It's not our faith. It's just faith based on who we affiliate with. If we affiliated with a different group, then that's what we would believe. The next level of faith is searching faith. And this is when a person decides it's not enough to just believe it because other people believe it. I really need to check this out for myself. I need to see what the Bible says about the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. I need to understand what the, what the Bible says about Revelation and the 666 and the Mark of the Beast. I, I need to know how a person becomes a Christian. I've heard about baptism, but, but is this in the Bible and what does the Bible say about it? Searching it out, owning it for myself. Now, I will tell you, this is the hardest level of faith, to go from affiliating faith to searching faith, because it's impossible to do that without struggling. You're going to struggle if you're going to search out your faith. This stage of growth is it's where you have your growth spurt, but it's the most painful. Did anybody in here, do you ever go through a growth spurt? Some of you, I can tell you didn't, so don't even raise your hand, all right? No. But I, actually, I say that, but I had a, a good friend who was 5'2". Now, we played baseball together. I played first base. He played second base. And, uh, and he actually went through a growth spurt, and he was only 5'2". But there was, a, I think it was sixth grade for him. And he shot up like uh, six inches in one year. I did the same. I had a, a growth spurt. I had Osgood Slaughters, if you're familiar with that, where uh, the knees, you, you run and your knees get stiff. And so I can relate to growing pains. Well, searching faith is where you get your growing pains. You're going to struggle. You're going to have some kind of struggle. And I don't have time to go, go through those struggles, but just keep in mind that this is the hard one. Searching faith is where I'm going to check this out for myself. I see what I've been taught, but I need to read the Bible and make sure this is what the Bible teaches. I'll talk more about these here in a minute. I'm going to give you biblical examples of each one of these, but just let me go through these quickly. So if imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith. The next one is solidifying faith. Once we have searched out our faith, there comes a point where we need cohesion. We need to put this all together. Now, obviously, you're going to be searching your whole life. I hope you're, you're always searching. I'm not saying that searching stops. But I've noticed that some people never go beyond searching faith because they search and search and search their whole life, but never really come down concrete on, here's what I believe. You understand the difference? Sometimes you can study and study and study something, but never really decide whether you believe it or not. Okay, I've studied this, and I keep studying it. Solidifying faith is when you say, okay, let me piece this all together. This is, this is the evidence that I've been ga gathering. I haven't had all my questions answered, but I have sufficient evidence here to decide. That's, that's how you do it in a jury case, right? You don't get all the questions answered, but I've got enough answers, I can decide, guilty or not guilty. Well, the same thing is true with our faith. 
You can study it out, but at some point, you've got to come down solid and say, here's what I believe. And if you don't do that, you don't get to the fifth and the highest stage, which is mature faith. Mature faith is where you get to that point, and nothing is going to stop you from doing what God tells you to do. Mature faith is not sinless perfection. It's not where you reach the point where you're just on a plateau and you're never going to do any wrong. That is not mature faith. There are too many examples in the Bible of mature faith, and I can share several with you. We will look at one tonight. These people are not perfect. The men and women that have mature faith in the Bible, they're not perfect people. But they do reach that point where it doesn't matter what you do to them, you can throw them in prison, you can beat them, you can call them names, you can tell them don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. They're going to do the will of God. That's what mature faith is. Mature faith is where I'm standing on God and nothing is going to dissuade me or turn me away from being the man or the woman that God has called me to be. All right, so let's look at all these together here. Imitating faith is the first one. Uh, affiliating faith, and then searching faith, and then solidifying faith, and mature faith. If we were teaching the class, I'd make you memorize these, but uh, I know some of you have these memorized already, but it's really helpful to have the terminology. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I made these words up 30 years ago, except for mature faith, obviously. But I, I, uh, these are ways to kind of picture how we grow up. Just like a child grows up, this is how we grow up spiritually. And if you'll learn these, it will help you to figure out where you're at in your faith and what you need to work on to grow in your faith. But it also will help you with anybody that you're working with, your children, or if you're, you're trying to help somebody else in the church to grow strong in their faith, this helps you to get the, the uh, terminology down so you have something you can talk about. All right. So now let's get into some biblical examples. Each of these is in the Bible. The hardest one to find is imitating faith, so I did my best. But uh, the, the first one that we're going to look at is Simon. Now I told you already that imitating faith is the faith of a child. The Bible really, it mentions children, but it doesn't really go into their lives and, and what they're thinking and other, those kind of things. And so I had to find an adult that had imitating faith. And this was hard. But if anybody had it, it was Simon. Simon the sorcerer, you remember, he was in Samaria. And as Philip came in and he was preaching the word, Simon was the one who had entertained the crowds and he could do magic tricks of some kind and he had a big following. But when Philip came in, Philip had the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit and he was doing the real thing. And people were going to Philip and they were being baptized. Simon the sorcerer, was baptized. He believed, and he repented, and he was baptized into Christ. And so let's pick up the story here in verse 14. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. Now let me pause here a moment, because this is, this is kind of interesting. John, if you go back and read Luke chapter 9, James and John were the ones that when they went into Samaria and they were rejecting the message of Jesus, do you know what James and John wanted to do? Lord, we should call down fire on these people. That was in Samaria. Read it. It's in Luke chapter 9, verse, verse 54. When they need somebody to go to Samaria, who do they send? They send John, the one who wanted to call down fire on these people. You go down there, John. Go down there and help those Samaritans. So here he is. He's with Peter. Verse 15, who came down and they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. I need to stop there and talk a little bit about this. When it says that they had not Receive the Holy Spirit in verse 15. There's two manifestations of the Holy Spirit. There's the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, and then there's the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling and the empowering, if you will. 
So the indwelling is what we receive when we are baptized into Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when those who heard the gospel message preached by Peter were pierced to the heart, and they said, what do we need to do? Verse 38, Peter's reply was, repent and be baptized, each of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift, not the miraculous gifts. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. They received it when they were baptized. These people, and we didn't read uh, before this, but they did believe in, in uh, the good news in verse 12. They were baptized. Simon in verse 13 believed and was baptized. If they did not receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they weren't saved. Now I'm saying that because if you, if you have friends who, who don't believe that baptism is necessary to salvation, who don't believe that that's when we receive the Holy Spirit, if they say, well, when you believe, that's actually when you're saved, they believed, and if you're going to say they didn't have the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 verse 9 says, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. And so you have to conclude that they're not saved. And nobody really should believe that. They believed, they repented, they've been baptized, they've received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I hope that helps you to understand verse 16 when it says, He had not yet fallen upon any of them. The He is the Holy Spirit. He had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but they didn't get the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit because Philip could not pass the miraculous gifts on. He had the miraculous gifts because he had received them from an apostle, but he couldn't pass them on because he was not an apostle. And that will become clear as we read here in the next verse, actually. So I stopped in uh, verse 14. Now when the apostles were in Jerusalem, now I've read that, I stopped in verse 18, sorry. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this authority as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. So even Simon could see the way the miraculous gifts were received was by the laying on of the apostles' hands. We don't have apostles today to lay our hands on us, therefore we don't receive the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit anymore. But we still receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Simon not only wanted the miraculous gifts, he wanted the ability to lay his hands on people and transfer the miraculous gifts. Would you agree with me that his faith is not very strong at this point? He doesn't understand. He has imitating faith. Okay, I see what the apostles are doing. I want to imitate that. I, I want to do what they're doing. And you can tell by Peter's reaction, he wasn't a good choice on his part. He has very small faith. I'm not saying he wasn't saved, because imitating faith is still faith. But it was faith at its most basic level. That's what imitating faith is. All right, let's talk about the next one here. Let's talk about affiliating faith. Go to John chapter 4, if you would. In John chapter 4, Jesus is in Samaria. He talks to a Samaritan woman, asks her for a drink. They get to talking about other things. They talk about her marital situation. And uh, he says, go call your husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. Yeah, you've had, you've had several, and the man you're living with is not your husband. She changes the subject. She wants to talk about 
about worship. In verse 23 and, and 24, Jesus explains to her, it, it's not about up on the mountain, it's not about in Jerusalem. The true worshiper is the one who's going to worship in spirit and truth. So that's the background of verse 25. Let's, let's pick up the story there. It says, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. When he said that, she believed it. Verse 27, at this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed. They had been speaking with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot. By the way, that's what she came for, was to get water. Left the water pot. That's not important anymore. And went into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and were coming to him. So you see what she did. She left her water pot. She goes and she says, Come see this man. He told me everything I did. Could this be the Christ? It's like, you need to decide for yourself. I've already decided. He is the Christ. Come with me. And so she is leading these people to Christ with affiliating faith. Now, the disciples have a, a, a talk with Jesus. Let's skip that part. Go down to verse 39. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, now get this, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. So you see what happened there? They came to Christ with affiliating faith. But they didn't stay there. They went on to search out Christ for themselves. Now, if we were in a class, I'd, I'd get my ropes out and I would teach you the ropes. But uh, in place of that, I have a little illustration up here on the screen for you. So here is Jesus, and here is the Samaritan woman. And Jesus extends faith to the Samaritan woman, which is represented by the line here. So he extends faith to her. You know, I know the Messiah is coming. He says, I'm he. I am the Messiah. So she believes in him. And then she goes and tells the townspeople. But at this point, their faith is dependent upon her. And there's all sorts of problems with this. First of all, it's, it's fine to come to Christ this way. This is how you probably came to Christ. Some affiliation. A parent, a preacher, a friend, uh, an uncle, I don't know, some, some affiliation, somebody brought you to Christ. So it's okay to come to Christ this way, but we don't want to stay in this position because as you can see, everything that they are going to learn is filtered through her. So she's listening to Jesus and she's telling it to them, but what if she didn't hear it right? What if she misunderstood something? She's going to pass on a false teaching. That's not good for, for them, is it? Also, she knows that she needs to get the message directly from Jesus and pass it on. That puts a lot of pressure on her. And so that's, that's what, this is what causes uh, leadership burnout. Teachers, preachers, elders, they get burned out. It's because of this pressure. Okay, everything's kind of coming through me. I've got to make sure I get all this right. And, and that's just more pressure than really we can handle. Another problem is, right now, she is tied up thinking about all these people she's working with. She's not able to focus on her relationship with Christ as much because she's, she's over here. And so she's not going to grow as strong, and yet she still has more responsibility than she had before. And then the other problem is, She's not likely to share her faith because she's got her hands full. She can't reach out to anymore. Can they share their faith? Well, they can, but they're not likely to because they have affiliating faith. And people with affiliating faith are not normally evangelistic. Most people that are evangelistic in the church have searching faith, 
or, or better, solidifying faith or mature faith. So, the, the, that's the problem. The solution, get everybody tied into Jesus. That's the goal. Get every member to search out their faith. So that's what we're trying to achieve uh, here is to get to where every member is searching out their faith. All right. Say a few more things about affiliating faith. Affiliating faith is the best way to lead someone to Jesus, but they must go on to search out their faith. And we need to encourage that. If you believe what you believe because others believe it, you have affiliating faith. If you want to know where you're at, if the things that you believe right now tonight, if you believe... I knew that mic was going to go out on me. <laughs> Actually, I told Kathy today, I said, I bet that battery's low on my mic. So, If you believe these things only because somebody else believes them, then this is the kind of faith you have. You have affiliating faith. And you need to search out your faith and own it for yourself. All right, uh, let's talk about the next one. Searching faith. What does that look like? Well, one of the best examples is in Acts chapter 17, if you'll join me there. Paul and Silas have been in Thessalonica. The work went well in Thessalonica. People were coming to Christ, but he had to leave. There was problems with, not with the, the believers, but the non-believers, and it caused a lot of trouble for Paul, and he had to leave. So, but in verse 10, Acts chapter 17 and verse 10 says, Now, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, look at this, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Paul did the same thing he did in Thessalonica. If you back up and look at chapter 17, verse 1, he went to the synagogue of the Jews. When he went to Berea in verse 10, he went to the synagogue of the Jews. Did the same thing. But the result was a little bit different. Those in Thessalonians, they accepted the things, and this is Paul. I mean, why wouldn't you accept it? This is the Apostle Paul. He's, he's not likely to mislead you. But when he went down to Berea, they were of more noble character, the Bible says, because they listened to Paul, but then they examined the Scriptures to make sure it was true. I kind of picture them coming up to Paul after his sermon and say, did you say that was in Deuteronomy or Daniel, that, that passage about the kingdom? We're, we want to look that up and just check it out and just... You know, just make sure that we've got that right. And they would, they would check out the scriptures to see for themselves if what Paul said was true. If they did that, you think Paul would have been offended by that? I'll bet not. I bet he didn't mind that in the least. They're examining the scriptures. They're searching it out. They're owning it for themselves. They're going beyond affiliating faith. They're going on beyond their affiliation with Paul and saying, we want to know for sure this is what the Scriptures say. This is what we need to do. We need every member to have that hunger to move past affiliating faith. Don't be content to just accept something because this is what you've been told your whole life. Check it out in the Scripture. Now I'm going to air a little bit of our dirty laundry here. Let's be honest, church. What do we criticize denominations for doing? Do, do we not criticize denominations because you just accept that because your pastor said that or because your, your father said that, your, your priest? That's what we accuse denominations of doing, just accepting things because that's what they were told. Brothers and sisters, do we do the same thing? In all honesty, don't we do the same thing? We need to search. We need to make sure. Don't believe something just because it's said from the pulpit or said in a class. Check out the scriptures. Make sure this is what the Bible says. 
Own it for yourself. All right. Let's go on here. The next level of faith, uh, kind of, there are several ways I could have gone with solidifying faith, but I think Timothy is a great example of that. If you'll turn to 2 Timothy, I'll, I'll show you why. Timothy, we get the impression from what we know about him, he was somebody who had searched out his faith, but didn't quite have mature faith. He was getting there. He was an understudy of the Apostle Paul. He knew a lot. He had great faith, and he is going to be commended in the passage we're reading about for his faith. But he still, he still had to do some things. He still needed to, to solidify the searching that he had done. Look what Paul tells him in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. Isn't that neat that Paul knew his mother and his grandmother? Paul says, I, I remember your grandma. I remember what she was like. Man, she had great faith. I remember your mom, too, and how strong her faith was. And Timothy, I see that in you as well. Very complimentary. Verse 6, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Timothy, I see this faith in you, but I want to encourage you to kindle afresh. Some translations say to fan into flame the gift that's in you. Now, since this gift was received by Timothy through the laying on of an apostle's hands, I believe this is talking about a miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, the, the principle applies here that when we have a faith, sometimes we need to fan our faith to a flame. How many of you, and this will really date some of you, how many of you ever tried to start a fire with a cigarette lighter from a car? Raise your hand if you've ever tried to do that, okay? You know, you get that, you, you push it in and it gets hot and then you put it against paper and what does it do? It just smokes until you, until you blow on it or you fan it and then poof, it pops into flame. If you've ever seen that, do you understand that illustration? Fan it into flame. It's just... Your faith is just kind of smoldering right now. You need, to, you need to blow on a little bit. You need to fan that into flame. Get the flame going. And that's what Timothy needed to do. He had searched. He had been reading the Scripture. He's, at this point, he is an evangelist with the church in Ephesus. So he's knowledgeable of the Scripture. But he needed to solidify. You need to, Timothy, you need to come down solid here on what you believe. Fan that into a flame. All right, one more here. Let's look at mature faith. A lot of examples I could have used for mature faith, but I chose Paul in Acts chapter 27. You'll join me there. This is our, our last one. I wanted to, to pick Paul because we're very familiar with his life. We know about Paul from the day he was converted on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, and we can kind of see how his faith grew. This is toward the end of his life. He's under arrest. He is being taken by ship to Rome to stand trial for these accusations against him as being a troublemaker and a leader of this sect called Christianity. They are on this ship, and he has warned them not to travel. He, he said, I don't think this is safe, this isn't good, but they didn't listen to him. And they went out, and they, they're, they're a long time, uh, starting in verse 14, they're a long time in this tossed about on the sea, to the point that they're starting to lose faith. And look at verse 21 with me. Acts 27, verse 21. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. 
So that's Paul saying, I told you so, <laughs> right? You didn't listen to me. I told you so. Yet, now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. You know, Paul wasn't a perfect man. But his faith in God was unwavering. Here's a prisoner standing up on this ship saying, Listen, men, don't worry. You're not going to lose your life. Now, we're going to lose the ship. And I know this because my God told me. That's mature faith. Another thing that impresses me, as he's describing God, he says in verse 23, For the very night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me. You get straight who you belong to and whom you serve, you're well on your way to mature faith. But you've got to get that straight. Who do you belong to and who do you serve? Paul says, I serve God. And my God told me I've got to stand trial before Caesar. So he's going to spare my life but he's graciously given me the lives of everybody else on this ship. So take courage, men. He speaks with such confidence because of the maturity of his faith. This should be the goal of every single Christian, is to have mature faith. This should be your goal, brother, sister. Your goal should be to that, get to that point. You do the will of God no matter what happens. No matter what somebody else says, I mean, so often you hear about people and, you know, they're doing really well in their faith and then all of a sudden they're not doing so well. And you go talk to them and say, you know, what happened? Well, I went to church and oh, so-and-so didn't shake my hand, you know, or, or this happened or that happened. And, you know, sometimes it's the most petty things that pull us away. We need maturity in our faith. So if other people don't do what they're supposed to do, that's fine. I'm still going to do what I'm supposed to do. If we can get every member of the church, can you imagine an entire congregation of members with mature faith? What could God do through a church like that? I mean, just uh, it's tantalizing to think about. Let's strive for that. Figure out where you're at in your walk with God and move forward in your faith. I appreciate your time tonight. I hope this has been helpful to you. We are going to offer an invitation. If you don't have faith, if you have never given your life to Christ, you've never repented of your sins, been baptized into Christ, we would love to help you with that tonight. This is a great time to do that. If you have obeyed the gospel, but you've not been as faithful as you should be, and you know it, and there's something heavy on your heart and you need prayers for, please come to the front as we stand and sing.